So uh, I'm David Retork, and uh, I'm here with Lawrence Journey, who's the director of Soundstreams, and Paul Frenner, who's uh, the, the composer of a new piece we're premiering on this concert. So Lawrence, why don't I get you to talk for a moment about, uh, about the concert, about who's involved, and how this all came about, if you would. Okay. Um, as always with uh, our projects, uh, a few different, uh, if I could use a, a bad pun, a few different streams, it sounds like <laughs> a few different strands actually came together. Um, we have worked with Paul, um, this is the fourth big piece, I think, when I say oh, big, wow. Paul's done um, a Lila for uh, double orchestra, uh, which actually went on to win a, a prize in uh, the Montreal Symphony competition with the Ken Uh Paul did a setting of the seven last words for a male soprano choir and string orchestra. Um, he has done, a, it's a, a kind of a concerto, a Berliner concert for a piano trio and a string orchestra, done, done uh, originally by the Griffin Trio and a, a, the Württemberg Chamber Orchestra, who come from Baden-Württemberg, same uh, state within Germany as does uh, the Stuttgart Chamber Choir. Uh, and of course, today's piece, which is no small, uh, no, it's no little ditty, no, no little ditty. So, so we have a history with Paul, and and uh, and, and a wonderful composer. But and on top of that, wonderful at, at thinking of uh, sort of the big architecture. Right? But Paul really likes to to dig into big themes and big ideas and big subjects. And, and I I really enjoy working with him in, in, in that capacity. So, um, so that's one strand. Uh, Frieder Bernius and the Stuttgart Chamber Choir appeared on our series um, in 1999 uh, for the first time, and then Frieder actually came to us, but without his choir, to do a project in a choral festival of ours in 2005. But uh, Frieder, he, it's funny, he doesn't remember this very well, but he played a very important part, not just as a, 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 an artist contributing something significant, but uh, we had did a project in 99 with him that really was a, a sort of an aha moment. Um, when we brought, uh, presented them in 1999, uh, th they were, of course, already very well known for many things, but especially for Bach. But we're an organization that, with all due respect to Bach, is much more interested in living composer. What are we going to do? How can we even do this? <laughs> so we, we came up with two different programs that were done uh, a couple of days apart. The first one was a solo concert of theirs where they did only Bach motets. And then we did a second concert uh, where we put them together uh, at, at that time with the Elmer Arthur Singers, and it was a whole program of contemporary music. Actually, we did look at uh, uh, looks like Terna. We did a, a new work for Harry Friedman by Harry Friedman for two choirs. And I, I don't remember everything was done, but it was basically a contemporary program. And the um, the audience was twice the size for the contemporary program than it had been for Bach. The kind of lights went on, and you know, up to then, I had always liked choral music, but we hadn't been particularly involved in presenting it as an organization. Right. And that experience actually uh, taught me that, uh, boy, what they say is not true, because there's all this sort of mythology about audiences for, for choral music being very conservative and all the rest of it. Maybe there's some truth to it, but it's the old story that if you do something really well, it's unfamiliar to people, um, you really can, you can touch them, you can reach them. And ever since, 99, we had that experience with Frieder. We've actually programmed a lot of contemporary music, commissioned a lot of works, of course, including uh, working with Paul. And, and uh, in a way, I can, in, in many ways, I can thank Frieder because he was part of the project that kind of uh, illustrated that it wasn't that he went into it intending to do that one way or the other. But, uh, and of course, um, uh, we are developing and have developed a, a, a relationship with Torque, who've been a number of, of projects with us, and we love your, your energy and enthusiasm and, and, and vitality, and uh, uh, we thought, what a, what a great opportunity to, to bring those three elements all together in one piece. So, sorry to give you a longish answer, but each one of those sort of spokes was, was quite important. Here we are. Fantastic. So, a uh, main part of this concert is, uh, as we mentioned, is Paul Frenner's new piece, which is entitled Corpus for a Double Chamber Choir and Percussion Quartet. And uh, we had our first rehearsal with the choir today with Frieder and the Stuttgart Chamber Choir, and it uh, is a really incredible piece. It's exciting, certainly, for us because the four of us have only been rehearsing with ourselves, so it's great to finally hear the choir parts and uh, hear how that's all coming along. Also, exciting because we have uh, hundreds, it seems like, of instruments on stage, which is always fun. 
at least for the playing part, not so much for the moving, but uh, but always always fun for the playing. So, uh, Paul, maybe I'll ask you a little bit uh, about the piece, about sort of the, the genesis for the idea, and, and uh, maybe you could talk just a little bit about the structure and where, where it all came from. Yeah, well, uh, it was uh, probably around a couple of years ago when uh, Lawrence approached me about uh, writing a piece for uh, the Stuttgart uh, uh, Chamber Choir, and, uh, and there was some debate as to uh, what other component would there be. And uh, we tossed a, a couple of ideas back and forth. I seem to remember suggesting four oboes to him. Uh, and I learned the oboes. And, uh, and I thought, don't do you require a four oboes? <laughs> no, he, he fucking dissuaded me. <laughs> we thought maybe some brass. And, uh, and uh, eventually he suggested percussion quartet. And uh, it was a, an idea that I found to be really compelling. And uh, uh, I got the wheels turning. Um, I spent a, a lot of time uh, thinking about text, about what, just what text am I going to, uh, uh, to be setting. My original idea was to uh, uh, write a piece called Mystical Prayers, in which I was going to be setting uh, texts from uh, mystics, uh, religious mystics from the uh, Middle Ages. And um, as, as the process was, was moved, moving along, the process being uh, searching for a text, the more I thought that I actually wanted to bring uh, something modern, some mo more modern text uh, to the uh, to the table, and so uh, I spent a lot of time looking for uh, uh, some sort of modern text that has some sort of mystical aspect to it. And I found a text by uh, Michael Simons Roberts, uh, a British uh, author and poet, uh, in his collection. His uh, collection is called Corpus, and uh, all the poems in there there are around forty four poems, I, think, I believe there are. Um, they deal with the body. In its various states of uh, existence, and the bodies that are living, bodies that are dying, bodies that are already dead, that are lying on the uh, coroner's lab as they're being examined, uh, and then bodies in the afterlife. And I found these uh, poems to be absolutely fascinating. And then uh, I was trying to figure out, well, what text would I pair with, uh, with, this, uh, with these texts? And, uh, well, to preface that, uh, the text that I finally chose was uh, by Michael Science Roberts, it was a poem called Corpse, in which the, there's a body that's lying on the road, it's roadkill, or maybe it's a body that's been uh, killed in some sort of war, it's not clear, there's a, it's a bit of an enigma what happened to this body, but the spirit is looking down on his own body, and uh, I thought of uh, combining it with something older, going back to the Middle Ages, and the D.A. Zeter text has always fascinated me, being, uh, being Catholic, and, uh, and all we, we seem to be a bit obsessed with, with death, death, death and uh, <laughs> afterlife, and uh, the, things like that. And then I wanted to look back even, even further, and I started looking uh, uh, for possibly some Arabic poems or some you know, poetry in Hebrew. Eventually, I settled on some texts uh, uh, from. Um, Ecclesiastes? Uh, yes, Ecclesiastes. <laughs> I was going to say Deuteronomy. That was Deuteronomy. Ecclesiastes, that, that's it. And uh, in which there's this representation of the body, the sea as a body to which, uh, and the sea is never full. It can always accept more bodies and it's uh, constantly being replenished. We come from the sea and then we go back to the sea. And I thought this uh, idea sort of sums up everything in, in the piece. Uh, as far as the is I thought that, that text itself uh, would go uh, very well with uh, what, percussion. <laughs> and also, even in Michael Simon's uh, Robert's poem, about uh, uh, this, this, uh, this body that has had some incredible violence enacted upon it, and just the sonorities that you can get with, uh, with percussion, uh, the, the strong sonorities and sharp attacks, but as well uh, the idea of the sea and all these other special ways of playing the instruments that you can, that you can use to. Uh, Create a, an atmosphere, a, 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 a timbre to the, uh, uh, to create an ambience. And so, so it's a, it's, a, it's a it's a piece that uh, really does focus on the idea of of the death and the afterlife, and looking at it from multiple perspectives. Yeah, and certainly from uh, from our point of view, I know it's the part is especially interesting for us because, with the exception of uh, a couple of tuned gongs, the percussion parts are entirely. Uh, what would normally be considered unpitched. There's no keyboard instruments, there's no traditional uh, melody or harmony in our parts, and so it is really about uh, about 
all those sounds about the textures, about the atmosphere, about the attacks, about the sustains, and it's a, there's some really, really beautiful texture writing. There's a couple of great instruments that you used. The water phone is always a water phone. Is that what that was? Yeah. yeah. The, the, the one that's got, it's sort of, it almost looks like a, it's one of those baskets that you put lights on. Except yeah, some, like some people describe it also as the, uh, the baseball, the World Series trophy. Yeah, so that's, we actually have two of those. We're borrowing a, a mega base water phone. All right. Uh, which is which is pretty exciting and uh, are they those, on the yellow pages? Is that where you? Yeah, <laughs> something like that, something like that. Yeah, there's, there's a store in the corner. Yeah. Um, and uh, lots of drums. Uh, each of us has a timpani, which uh, we we use to uh, to some cool effects and a lot of trading notes back and forth. Uh, lots of gongs and cymbals and, and beautiful metal ringing sustains, which are. Uh, which are pretty cool. And how, so I know you and Dan were workshopping some things. Mm -hmm. Is that sort of how you came to the final instrument selection? Because I know there was a few yeah. ideas being tossed back. Yeah, that, that, that's it. Uh, I hope Dan did ask me, uh, sort of said, but there's no mallet instruments and no keyboard percussion. <laughs> uh, no, no. Uh, uh, eventually, I guess you have to decide what you're going to do and what you're not going to do. And as you can see, there's already loads of instruments. And, uh, and probably the last thing you would want to cart around would be uh, three octave or four octave marimba. Yeah, <laughs> there, there, is, there is a lot of stuff up there. Yeah, yeah, just, yeah but, but I, I decided to focus on, on skins and uh, yeah, Dan and I, we met and we uh, did a lot of experimentation about striking uh, drums, different drums with different beaters and, uh, and just, I found fascinating to just the, the change of timbre that uh, you can get by playing on, for instance, a bass drum with a heavy beater uh, or a, a heavy hard beater versus a heavy soft beater versus a, a thinner stick, and uh, and likewise on many other drums. And uh, then uh, that he sort of uh, showed me uh, all the octaves of uh, gongs that you have. Yeah. <laughs> and my eyes started glittering when I saw that. <laughs> well, a lot of people do. Yeah, get that twinkle in their eyes a little bit. That's it. And I never realized that you actually had gongs that could be played so at such a high level, uh, pitch level. Yeah. Right? So I mean, some gongs that go uh, well into the treble clap. So, oh yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 So it was, it was a great uh, session that I had with Dan just uh, to try and sort things out. What it's going to use and what it wasn't going to use. Yeah. In terms of the, the way the percussion is, is used, um, I mean, I understand obviously there were a lot of uh, special sounds that you wanted to create and, and, and by you know, spending time with the percussionists, but do, 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 the, do the percussionists play in a sense different, uh, do they play uh, different roles? Do, do, do they represent uh, something beyond obviously reflections on, on, on the text at that moment? Do they, does each have a, char a character that in some ways is part of a drama? Was it more abstract than that? Um, well, the, uh, the the quartet uh, throughout most of the piece they f they function as uh, as a unit okay. in, in a way. Um, th there are moments in which the various players are doing their own thing, um, but it's often to create some sort of layered texture between the, the between the four of them. Yeah. And so, I mean, it starts off uh, in this fast section near the, the beginning with long, slow rolls in the tempi that are being passed between all four members. And then eventually there's a cadenza in which that idea uh, reappears, but they map it onto uh, uh, more drums. And the ideas get closer and closer together, and the rolls are faster. And But it's uh, uh, possible, you know, it, it could, uh, as far as representing something, yeah, I think there is definitely some relation between what they're playing and the text, uh, both the days area and the corpse. Uh, at that moment, um, sort of commentary on the text and embellishment of it, uh, uh, but but really, it's really the four of them acting together to create specific textures. Yeah, I was going to say it seems like we're we're all more or less a unit. I mean, the only time I think when I feel a little bit separated is there's times when I'm playing bass drum and the other three are still playing on toms, and I'm sort of. I guess leading the charge a little bit in terms of, of accents and drive and that sort of thing, but for the most part, we're, we're generally passing similar textures back and forth, mm -hmm. and it's a pretty uh, pretty coherent ensemble. Yeah, parts I, I would say. Yeah, it, it is ensemble, right? Really, even when uh, it gets into the the free sense of Missouri parts with the water phones, and mm -hmm. uh, it's still a, a layered idea. So, yeah, right? for sure. Yeah. Well, we're really uh, we're really looking forward to performing this piece. And Lawrence, uh, remind us what else is on the uh, the concert because this is just one piece of a of a fabulous concert. I understand monster program. Um, there are actually are there's a second choir on this program. The Stuttgart Chamber Choir, of course, is doing Paul's piece. Uh, 
also our own Choir 21 under uh, the direction of David Follis is also participating, there are 24 of them. So the two choirs are doing some things together. They're doing, uh, I guess, the, the, the quite famous uh, Mahler, uh, Ich bin der Welt, that, that's, that's for two choirs. Uh, they, uh, they're also doing um, a movement from a wonderful double uh, choir work. It's a mass by uh, Frank Martin. Um, they are doing uh, Sanctus and Benedictus uh, together from uh, uh, Penderecki. Uh, also uh, his Agnus Dei. So, uh, and then, um, I'm trying, oh yes, and uh, I should say that uh, those are things that are done by both choirs, and the uh, Frieder and David Falls take turns uh, conducting. Um, and uh, Choir 21 is doing on its own a very beautiful piece by Gilles Tremblay, actually yes. with percussion. Yeah, yeah, I think Dan's playing that one. Exactly, yeah. Le, Le Spas du Coeur, mm -hmm. which um, is not done very often because it's a, it's, a, it's, it's a beautiful but challenging piece. And of course, because it adds percussion, you know, not all choirs uh, are, are you know, always in a position to do that, but I happen to know the piece and, and, uh, and like it very much and think it's a really major addition to the choral repertoire. So. Um, so that's that's the show. It's a it's a blockbuster. Yeah, the good one. So this is happening on uh, Sunday, 3 p.m. at the Carlu. Uh, beautiful, beautiful venue. If you've not been there, though it, though it is up on the seventh floor, which is always interesting like, for corner, corner of College and Young. Corner of College and Young. Young it's called College, College Park. It is. It's College yeah. Park building. Yeah. 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 And actually, uh, some, some people listening to this might not n know the, the history of this place uh, very briefly. It used to be, well, this used to be called Eaton's College mm -hmm. Street, that whole building, and now it's College Park. And uh, the seventh floor where, that audit, where the auditorium is, what's now called the Carlo Concert Hall, it used to be called Eaton Auditorium. And there was a long period, I, I don't know how, but it goes back to the perhaps the 30s or 40s, maybe longer. Uh, for the longest time, it was the kind of the main concert hall in terms of uh, like it's 11 or 1200 seats, and uh, you know, for that capacity, it was what there was. And everybody came here, but uh, all the big artists came through and played there. The CBC used to use it for all kinds of concerts they produced, which is a, uh, we miss very much the idea that they might produce a concert. Um, and it was Glenn Gould's favorite uh, place to record. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he tried to buy it. Wow, I did that. Yeah, yeah, he used to he used to come in at midnight. Uh, he could like rent it practice and play all night. And when they went, and CBS used to come up here to record, you know, spent, once he got famous, you know, he just, just told him what he wanted to do and they did it. <laughs> they used to, and, they, and they would start at midnight, like finish, you know, at, at, at six o'clock in the morning, because school was a uh, night on. Anyway, so it's a, it's a it, and it's, it's, the style is called Art Modern, mm -hmm. apparently. I, I always thought it was Art Deco, wrong, but I'm too early for that. It's art modern and it's very beautiful. It's, it's been beautiful preserved. Space. Yeah, it's been preserved. So, uh, and it's acoustically, uh, no, nothing was done to change uh, what was a marvelous acoustic yeah. when it was taken by the developer, I guess, that owns College Park, did renovate. Uh, and the only change really they made was they took out, used to be rate seating on the first floor, main floor. They took all that out and now it's, uh, of course, they just bring chairs in as the number that are needed sure. and so on. But it didn't really change the acoustic, which is wonderful. Yeah. And, uh, and where can we get tickets for this fine event? The, the easiest way, you, you, you can buy at the door, uh, you know, 7th floor, uh, College Park, College and Young, but you can also buy them at rcmusic.ca. That's the box office. Uh, most of our series is in Kerner Hall, not to confuse people, but we use the box office at the RCM. So tickets for this are at rcmusic.ca. All right. Well, thank you to uh, Lawrence Turney, Artistic Director of Soundstreams, Paul Frenner, composer of uh, Corpus. My name's Jamie, and uh, hope to see you on Sunday yeah. when we come to. One, one last thing that's hot off the press. I heard today from uh, our marketing person at Soundstreams there is, uh, just as an introductory offer to people who might not have been to Soundstreams before, um, just about to go on sale is a special promotion where if you buy one ticket, you get a second ticket at 50% off. There you so go. if you needed an excuse, there it is. There's, there's no reason not to go. Exactly. Well, thank you, gentlemen. We're looking forward very much to the concert on Sunday, and uh, we'll see you there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>